If you're not from Britain, you probably don't know who I am. I'm a university professor, I'm a pollster, and I write one of our uh, country's biggest substacks. Uh, as of this morning, we've just passed 30,000 uh, readers, um, thank you, um, and uh, 30,000 people who are fed up of the broken political consensus in our country and who are watching the events of this conference very closely. Um, I'm also an Englishman and a Welshman. Um, my family come from the steel factories of Northern England and the coal mines of South Wales. My grandfather fought the fascists in the Second World War in the jungles of Burma. My grandmother sang for the troops during the Second World War uh, and they met on a boat in the Indian Ocean uh, for three days. Uh, and they fell completely in love. And when my grandfather came back from war two years later, uh, he didn't go and see his family. Uh, he drove down to a, a village in Wales that he could barely pronounce, Clonethi, and he found this woman that he'd met on the boat two years before. And he proposed to her and she said yes. And they got married and they had my mother and they stayed married for more than 60 years until they died. And they passed away before our vote for Brexit. And I always wonder, how they would have voted at that referendum, I'm pretty convinced they would have voted to leave the European Union because perhaps like many of your ancestors, they represented and embodied the very best of who we are. They cared deeply about our institutions and the symbols of our nationhood, like the royal family, like the countryside, like cricket. Uh, they cherished our ways of life and they wanted to preserve and pass on our values. They were tolerant of others, and they cared a lot about people from other countries, but they were also strong. They weren't easily pushed around by dogmatic ideologues, by fanatics, by radical extremists. They believed passionately in national democracy. And their outlook tells us a lot about why people voted for Brexit in Britain. They wanted to preserve their distinctive national identity. They wanted to protect their culture, and their ways of life. They wanted to reassert our democratic institutions. They wanted to preserve who they are by lowering immigration, by controlling our borders. And they wanted to reform the institutions by having more of a say and more of a voice over the decisions that affect their daily lives. And I think if you look back at that vote, what's become clear in the eight years since the Brits voted for Brexit is that actually much of our political class on both the left and the right, Labour and the Conservatives, really haven't understood what that vote was all about. The British Conservative Party in particular, which has been governing our, governing our country since 2010, the British Conservative Party has fundamentally failed to seize the opportunity that Brexit presented our country with. Instead of lowering immigration, the Conservatives sent immigration to entirely new levels. Instead of controlling our national borders, they lost control of our national borders. Instead of sending power down to the people, they hoarded it for themselves. Instead of pushing back against new radical ideologies like wokeism and radical progressivism, they allowed the mainstreaming of gender ideology in our schools, our universities, and our national health service, which only last week, as we saw with the landmark Cass Review, has been exposing our children to ideas, beliefs, and medical treatments that have absolutely no basis in science. Ideology was consistently put ahead of evidence by the expert class. And instead of preserving who we are, the British Conservatives allowed the mainstreaming of critical race theory in our primary and secondary schools, one in four of which have been shown through freedom of information requests to be drawing explicitly on CRT. They're teaching our children that fundamentally they should be ashamed of who they are, that their British or English identity or Welsh identity or Scottish identity is fundamentally a source of shame and embarrassment. And the only thing you should be proud of is our definition as being a country that's open to diversity and multiculturalism. But to say that a country is open to diversity is like saying a country doesn't have an identity of its own. And the British Conservatives have not only been presiding over the mainstreaming of these ideas, but have been fundamentally failing to understand one of the key lessons of the Brexit referendum. Brexit was never the end destination. Brexit was never the end of the journey. Brexit was merely the end of the beginning. <laughs> 
Brexit was the first stop in a journey on which the British people are trying to take back power for themselves, trying to reform the institutions and trying to build a politics that is much more representative of their values and their voice. And the British Conservatives and the Labour Party and much of the political class have failed to see what the second chapter in this story is going to be all about. It's another political project that's being imposed on ordinary people from above. It's a political project that is completely transforming our country, which is already becoming unrecognizable. And it's a political project which, unless somebody stands up and does something about, is only going to accelerate in the years ahead. And that project comes down to two words, mass immigration. Between Tony Blair coming to power in 1997 and today, the rate of net migration in Britain has increased from 50,000 a year to 700,000 a year. It's more than doubled since the vote for Brexit. The Conservative Party, in other words, have ushered in a cultural and political revolution that is simply unprecedented in the entire history of our country. Along the way, they've lost control of our borders. More than 120,000 people have arrived in Britain illegally on the small boats. And they've lost control of the government institutions that are charged with processing those illegal migrants and removing them from the country. Here's one statistic. Of the 120,000 people who entered Britain illegally since 2018, we have success successfully removed 1.3% of those people. Now, Boris Johnson told us that we were going to lower migration, that we were going to have an Australian-based points system which would bring in the best of the best. We would be getting high skill, high wage, highly selective, high value migration that would put more into the economy than it would take out. Boris Johnson lied and the British Conservative Party lied. What we got instead was low skill, low wage, low value, non-selective migration, which is now taking more out of the economy than it's putting in. All of the studies on non-EU migration into Europe show the same thing, from Denmark to the Netherlands, to France, I write about them each week, that typically low-skill migration from outside of Europe is a net fiscal cost, not a net benefit to Western economies. Even worse, something you don't know about Boris Johnson, something many of his supporters don't know about him, he removed the requirement for British companies to advertise jobs in Britain before they're advertised elsewhere in the world. Boris Johnson was not a conservative because the Conservative Party is no longer conservative. If you look at the two million or so people who came into Britain over the last two or three years, what percentage of those people do you think came in on high-skilled working visas? It was 15%, one five. The rest were students, the relatives of students, the relatives of those workers, asylum seekers and illegal migrants. What we are building, in other words, is an economy that is completely based upon consumption. We're just throwing bodies at the national economy to keep big business happy, to keep the big parties in Westminster happy, and to keep everybody from having to avoid the big challenges that Britain is facing. Our collapsing social care system for our elderly relatives, our national health care system, the NHS, our bankrupt universities, all we're doing, like a drug addict, is using cheap mass migration to try and plug the holes, to try and keep us from having to deal with the problems that are underpinning Britain's economy. But this isn't only about GDP. This isn't only about how migration is impacting Britain's economy. This is also about our national culture. It's about our ways of life. It's about our values. It's about what holds us together as a people with a distinctive identity and a distinctive sense of who we are. The kinds of migration that Britain is now being exposed to are much more diverse in terms of their culture, in terms of religion, uh, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of uh, their cultural backgrounds. 
If you look at where Britain is going to go over the next 12 years, between my daughter being two years of age and 14, according to the Office for National Statistics, we're going to have another 6.5 million people enter Britain. 6.1 million because of migration. 92% of all population growth in Britain over the next decade or so will be because of migration. We're going to see a speed of change that we cannot currently comprehend. To put it this way, it took us half a century to go from 50 million to 60 million people. It's going to take us 20 years to go from 65 million to 75 million. Britain is also going to see the largest increase in Europe over the next 20 years in the absolute number of Muslims within our population, the share of which is currently forecast by the reliable and independent Pew Research Center to increase to almost 20% by 2050. And as we know, as I wrote about last week, many British Muslims, especially younger Muslims, hold views that are fundamentally at odds with our way of life. Here's just a few. A survey last week, which was undertaken, showed that 40% of British Muslims uh, refused to accept that Hamas committed murder and rape on October the 7th, 40%. More than 50% think that showing a picture or cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad should be illegal in Britain. One third want to see Sharia law imposed on the country. 40% think it's acceptable to bully, harass and intimidate members of parliament by protesting outside their homes. And young British Muslims, as the survey made clear, are more radical than their parents and grandparents. So what I'm trying to point out to you is that unless we get serious about the challenges that flow through mass migration and also a lack of integration at the national and local level, the problems that we're currently experiencing are only going to accelerate going forward. And the most remarkable thing about this is that most ordinary people out there have absolutely no idea this is going on. If you ask voters to estimate what the average rate of net migration is in Britain today, the average estimate is 70,000 a year. The reality is 700,000. So what I'm suggesting to you is that what started with Brexit is slowly but inevitably going to morph into a second big rebellion against the establishment on this specific issue of migration. This is the dividing line in British politics in the years ahead. This is the issue on which Conservative Party, the Conservatives need to start speaking loudly and clearly about. Because the British Tories, some of whom will be speaking at this conference, have fundamentally failed to get their arms around this issue and have made it 10 times worse than it used to be. So what do we need to do? We need to build an entirely new political movement that is outside of the traditional left and right. We need to build a movement that pitches above and beyond Labour and the Conservatives. We need to reject the broken two-party system and we need to stop using the language of that system. We have a new party called the Reform Party which is doing well in the polls and some of their ideas are good ideas. But they too have fundamentally misdiagnosed the problem People in Britain don't just want to reform the system. They want to smash the system. They want to build a completely different kind of politics that is much more representative of their values, of their voice, and how they see their country. That means building something that speaks above and beyond the 20% of disillusioned conservatives. It means actually speaking to the 80% of people who say the big parties no longer represent people like me. Because they're right to think that way. If you look at every institution in British society, if you look at our political institutions, the creative industries, the cultural institutions, the universities and more, the voice of ordinary people is glaringly absent. Nobody in the corridors of power is speaking for the vast majority of ordinary British people. So what started with Brexit what started eight years ago, I'm here to tell you, is only just the beginning 
of a much broader political revolution in our country. And if you're interested in following that revolution, or even, dare I say, supporting that revolution, then please find me in the break, find me online, and thank you for your time.